right arm uh, to Christy is going to talk to us about supports for youth with anxiety. Thanks, Christy. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I'm Christy Gosbemus, and a uh, little introduction about myself. Right now I'm working as an education consultant with the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. And so we work on two very specific projects, the um, Safe Schools Healthy Students Project, which is in Beloit, Racine, and Menominee Indian School Districts. We can pilot uh, specific programs to help support mental health in schools with those projects. And then Project AWARE is in Adams Friendship, uh, Ashland, and Milwaukee. And so the gist of those projects are to provide safe schools, violent free schools, mental health supports, access to mental health care. Um, with Project AWARE specifically, I, I run the Youth Mental Health First Aid component throughout the state of Wisconsin. And we'll talk a little bit about that as, as one of the um, supports that we'll talk about for anxiety. But by history, I uh, have been a psychotherapist for the past 12 years before coming on with the department. And my big role with that was bringing in mental health uh, clinics into schools. And so at the start of doing that in 2002, I think there were maybe two or three that I'm aware of in the state. And now there's over 300 where providers are actually going into the schools and providing mental health supports, which increases access, less time away from class, right? Um, and then more collaboration, hopefully, between the provider and the school, where a lot of the behaviors that we see or the mental health challenges that we see in school are, are kind of manifested there and, and they can get some supports. So those are the things that I'm involved in right now. I've also been a county social worker. I've been a treatment foster care social worker. I've been um, working in the in home doing autism. And there's a huge intersection between anxiety and autism. And some of the clients that I would see um, in my private practice would, yes, they would have autism, but they were primarily coming in to see me for anxiety issues. And so um, I'll be talking about anxiety today broadly, but knowing that it definitely intersects with the autism spectrum disorder. There is a high comorbidity with the two. And so the overview is just whenever I can get a chance to, uh, we talk about the school mental health framework, so I'll be sharing that a little bit with you and kind of wrapping that around the anxiety. Talking about how we can motivate school staff and leaders to engage in mental health supports and teams in working with our youth. And then practical tools, hopefully, to support students, families with complex needs um, and anxiety specific today. And so this is where you can find the school mental health framework on our DPI website. Sometimes uh, DPI is a little hard to navigate the website, so I provided the the um, website link there and we know that one in five of our students are standing in front of us every single day as educators with mental health challenges and needs that might interfere with their academics and so we know that in order to increase their social emotional skills that that will also increase their academics if you're sitting in class and you're anxious and you're thinking about maybe if your mom is safe at home or what's going to be happening during the lunch hour, if you're going to be able to sit with your friends and anxiety is kind of permeating throughout um, your body in that way, you're not exactly thinking about the math lesson or the science lesson or what's happening, you know, um, with your reading. And so that's why we know that um, it's very important to have mental health supports in our schools. Uh, we recently, just an update at DPI, we recently hired a new um, emotional behavioral uh, consultant who will be starting, I believe, towards the end of March. And then they've also combined it, uh, combined that role with autism. And so she comes in with a lot of experience. I'm not going to say who it is yet because I don't know if they've publicly announced that. Okay. You just know it's a she. Uh, so this is really the school mental health framework, and it's hard to read like all the little things, but I just want to show that we kind of follow the tier. So if people are familiar with PBIS, we did that, you know, for a reason, that it's not a new innovation or initiative because teachers often will have kind of initiative burnout, like, oh, the next new thing. This is supposed to be overlaying what's already out there with the PBIS framework. 
Um, and so we'll be talking about anxiety. What I've done is I've created my anxiety talk and PowerPoint to go along the tiers. So it just kind of makes a little bit more sense because anxiety can be on a continuum. And there are kids with some anxiety and then there's kids with intense anxiety. And so we'll be talking a little bit about what um, kind of supports are needed at each time. But when I lay this foundation, and Hugh will be proud of me to put this right in the forefront, is the, the need for the parent collaboration as we move forward. So we're not just talking about school supports, but if we ignore the parents or the, the families that are involved with the kids or the community supports that are involved with our kiddos that are dealing with anxiety, we're missing a big chunk of information and supports that we can really help to increase our work. So whether you're out there listening as a provider, as a school personnel, or as a parent, um, you know, it's families are in the forefront. So we need to listen to our families because often they can provide us with data or material to do our jobs better. Um, and then there's this focus of building on relationships rather than providing programs. When I was first starting out as a school social worker, uh, I was told to do a, a love and logic program. And so I would have my parents come into the library and co-facilitate with somebody else, you know, another expert in the field of love and logic, even though my own kids were probably melting down in my shopping cart right before I came to teach the class, right? And um, when I would leave the class, I would walk out and the parents would be standing around in a circle outside their cars talking at length. Like I was long gone, pulled away, probably at home and in bed by the time they were done talking. And I really started recognizing parents aren't seeking experts in front of the room. Parents are seeking support from one another. And so I started running my classes, workshops, whatever you want to call them, as more of support circles and having parents have the time to talk about what their needs were versus talking at them. And that um, was just a really big transition in, in my work. And so I encourage if you're working with families, well, when you work with families, because it's not an if, that we really incorporate that kind of um, process with them. We can highlight their strengths and encourage families to experiment with new practices. So families are looking for help and support. Um, we can offer some and encourage them to experiment with them, but they generally know best of what can work with their child. And basically, it's about the relationship. It doesn't matter what tool I pull out of my pocket and you know work with a parent or, or a child with anxiety. If I don't have a relationship with that child or I don't have a relationship and connection with that parent and they can't feel my compassion or my empathy about the situation, um, nothing, no cognitive behavioral intervention or newfangled you know, tool I have is going to work. It's all about connection and really about empowering our parents to be on the voices. I run a parent advisory work group and I want parents in there because they're leading any, any of the products that I'm creating or things that I'm doing, I run past my parent work group because they're leaders in the state then and that's engaging them in a much more deep, powerful way so that they can have a voice in policy changes and initiatives. So just to, so that we're on the same page when we talk about anxiety, and I love that um, Hugh talked earlier about this gives us shared meaning. If a client is coming into my office and they've previously been diagnosed with a specific phobia versus post-traumatic stress disorder, it is a way to communicate between providers, but it definitely is not the whole story. And so when we start believing that people fit in categories and labels, we lose the person in front of us in the unique way that their anxiety might be manifesting for them. And so I really want to frame the discussion. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, and some would say obsessive compulsive, does that really fit on there? But definitely anxiety intertwines with that. Um, so it's not an exhaustive list, but it gives us a shared meaning um, and a common language to understand one another of what the child might be um, dealing with. So we're going to move into um, what kind of supports are at the universal level. And this is really the level that we have the most, I think, um, impact, but it's probably the less, least amount of time we spend on things. We always are looking at those really intense kids, 
But I feel if we did a better job down here, we wouldn't perhaps have really intense issues showing up in our school, our school settings. And so um, a little anxiety is important. If I didn't feel a little anxiety coming in and speaking in front of people this morning, um, there would be something wrong with me, right? So it motivates me. I, I get my act together. I get my PowerPoints to Tim on time. And hopefully, you know, all goes well. In the shower this morning, I might have been thinking about, oh gosh, you know, this is, you know, do I have everything together? Did I look over my notes? Did I, do I have everything? And, and that helps me. But when we're talking about anxiety with um, kids, we'll talk about what it looks like a little different at the tier two and tier three levels <laughs> and what it sounds like a little differently. So anxiety can look like nervousness, right? Trembling, yes. Um, maybe some constant movement. And that's why a lot of times um, misdiagnosed ADHD or something like that happens because they look so similar, everything looks so similar. It could be stressed out, feeling overwhelmed. Um, could be nervous laughter or fidgetiness. But I also want you to think about anxiety. It could be anger or outburst, right? And it could look like defiant or refusal. And it also could look like, I see all the time, oppositional. Those are actually some of my most favorite kids to work with, oppositional kids. Because there's usually something, a much bigger picture, underlying the labels that we give behavior. Um, it could look like perfectionism. So a thought would be like, if I'm not good at doing it right away, then why, why bother? Um, if I fail once, then that's going to tell me that I'm going to fail again. And so some of the um, adults around anxious kids can start feeling hopeless, frustrated, maybe even angry or anxious themselves. And there's a strong desire or need to control. So an anxious dialogue in the morning before coming to this um, talk might have sounded more like, oh man, you know, the last time I did a talk, I forgot this whole big piece of it that's gonna happen again. Why do I even bother going? Maybe I could call Tim and tell him I have the flu and I can't talk today and I shouldn't show up because, you know, things are just gonna go wrong. And so that's the difference between a slightly anxious dialogue that motivates you to really be prepared and do a good job and the difference between a dialogue that can shut our youth down, that can get them tapped out during a math discussion, that can take them out in social areas. Even getting on the bus can seem absolutely unbelievable, right, for the day. And so when we look at the universal, I want to think about it this way in that approximately 25%, and, and I um, put where I got this from, of 13 to 18 year olds have had an anxiety disorder in their lifetime. But the emphasis I want you to see in this slide is that we know in studies that universal preventions and strategies can reduce symptoms for all children and has beneficial effects for children at higher risk. And so that's really a powerful thing to be thinking of, that if we had universal um, shifts in how we did things, that it would impact a lot more students and they wouldn't have to move up the tiers or have the anxiety be very debilitating towards um, their academic or even just their um, life goals, their life desires that they have. So we know cognitive behavioral treatment works. We know cognitive behavioral treatment, including the family, works even better. And there's also evidence um, that shows that our interventions can significantly reduce anxiety and um, diagnoses around children if we use some of the universal practices that I'll share. So these are some of the ones I've identified. And again, this is not an exhausted list. It's just a list I think that's important to take a look at as a starting, starting the conversations place. And as we look at this list, uh, Hugh did a good job of mentioning Ross Green's work, but his work really is um, intertwined in our school mental frame, health framework in a significant way. That oftentimes, and I know that I was guilty of this when I first started out as a county social worker working in an alternative school for nine years, when a student was defiant or resistant, 
you know, that's how we label them. And we didn't look any deeper than that. We just created behavioral supports to try to move that students to a place that we, that, that felt good for us. But with Ross Green's work, he really says, um, it's a shift in perspective, not in that kids would do well if they wanted to, like they're somehow manipulating us, but kids would do well if they can. And that's a huge shift in perspective at the universal level for people to have when working with anxious kids. My own, um, I've had experiences with my own children and my stepson, when he was younger, would throw these major temper tantrums. And it wasn't until he was later on, middle school, and now he's a senior graduating, that I really realized, looking back, how much those were related to his anxiety over the situation. Worrying about feeling left out, worrying if the older siblings would pick on him in front of somebody and make him look stupid. Um, all of those kinds of things were happening in his head at a very rapid pace. And that was causing some of the behavior. And so if we would have looked a little deeper in the knowledge that I have now what I know, right? You don't know what you don't know. Um, there would have been a lot, different inter a lot of different interventions that we would have maybe tried as a family at that point. So the Trauma Sensitive Schools is a, right now there's 14 modules in the tier one. And I put the link on there and it's available for anybody to take a look at. Um, there's links on family engagement and then there's links on emotional regulation right now. So these are modules that anybody can take a look at, whether you're a provider or working in the schools, to really help support this perspective shift of that it's a skill deficit. That if kids could cope with their anxiety, they would, but they don't have a pocket full of coping skills. And so that our job is to give them that pocket full of coping skills in life so that they can better manage some of the symptoms that come out of anxiety. A lot of calls that we get in the Student Service Prevention Wellness Department, Division at um, DPI, are on bullying. And I see it with my own 14-year-old daughter, the cyberbullying. I mean, you, you have to, you're going to bed with instant Snapchats coming at you about who you are as a person, and then you're expected to show up for school the next morning. And so if we had our policies in place and actually followed them, what would that look like? And how might that prevent some of the anxiety that kids are coming to school with about what might be happening at school? And just the overall climate of our schools and at home, if they're welcoming, if kids feel like they have a voice, all of those things are at the universal level of supports. We have a lot of things we can do environmentally with structures, um, ways that we run our classrooms, foreshadowing what's going to ha be happening, especially when you have the intersection of the autism in there, um, foreshadowing what's going to happen, increasing skills and coping skills, and then weaving mental health curriculums throughout our day. That it's not just a health class that people take as part of their day, but that it's the whole concept of wellness is talked about from the first week to the last week of school throughout the time that we're in school. And also you as a role model, I often will share a story where I was working with a young man, young youth in my office and he had autism but was coming to me for anxiety and uh, the tornado alarm went off outside. I'm not particularly fond of tornadoes. It's probably right up there with one of my you know, bigger fears in life. And so my job right at that moment was how can I model how you, you know, emotionally regulate yourself as an adult and how do you, you know, get to a safe place. And so if we can model as adults our own management of anxiety and really name it and say, boy, I'm feeling a little anxious right now, so I'm gonna take a couple deep breaths, that's a really powerful thing when youth can see that we do what it, exactly what we're asking them to do, I think. And then just that I can't overemphasize the connections and relationships with kids, that they won't trust you with what's underlying their behavior if you don't have that connection and that relationship with them. The wrap plans are wellness recovery action plans. I put that at the universal level. They'll show up again at the tier three level. I'm really an advocate of when a student starts school the first week or two, they should all have wellness plans, not just the kids that we identify as needing the supports, but all kids. Because what I want teachers to really be talking about in their classrooms is Maybe today Johnny's having a bad day, but tomorrow it might be you. And so if we all had wellness plans and we knew that um, 
you know, Johnny's going to be off this t on Tuesday, but and he's using, you know, his skills. You might be off tomorrow. What skills could you use? I think that can be really powerful. Now, I added this to it, and it's not on my slide, um, but I'm going to add the pyramid model for early childhood. And this is a shout out to whoever gave me a review at the last time I did this. Like, what about the what about the little ones? I was able to witness the pyramid model um, in in work at a school in Racine Unified School District. And basically, what it is is it's just providing very clear, conscious, consist consistent messages to the littles about what the expectations are for the day. But also, I got to see like in their classrooms. Um, they would have emotional regulation places, safe spaces for them to go. And a lot of them were like crawl spaces that they could go under and then kind of shut themselves in. I talked to so many teachers in early childhood daycare centers all the way up to 4K and kindergarten. And the kid that's like got themselves, you know, under their desk, right? That's usually anxiety. You know, it's avoiding something that's happening or just being completely... Um, dysregulated and so they often will find crawl spaces and so providing those safe spaces as a proactive measure is so important um, and that's just part of the pyramid model it's a whole big um, thing that we're, we're doing piloting in, in some schools but I really see that it has a significant value um, also, I've seen teachers use stickers at the beginning of the year where they're making sure that all of the kids are having connections and so the stickers are given to the kids um, on a board in the teacher's lounge perhaps before school starts. These are kids I know I have a connection with. Any kid that's not missing, that does not have a sticker, then that's a kid that I know in the first week or two of school I need to connect with. Because again, that connection at the universal level is so important. And that's a really good technique that I've seen schools use to increase their connections. My daughter just started the Monona Grove School District, and I know there's a couple Monona Grove people here. Um, she started last year in seventh grade, probably one of the worst years for a girl to start a new school and new friendships. And um, when her teacher, Mr. Graham, uh, pulled her aside within the first two weeks and checked on her, I never heard the end of it. You know, she just talked about how that made her feel special and important and connected, and she knew she could go to him and talk. I think we undervalue the connections that we make with our kiddos and how important that is. And it takes a little time, right? Just a, a little five minute chat in the hall. How are you doing? You're making friends. Um, now we're gonna move into interventions for some, right? Some of the kids that are having maybe more um, issues or concerns or interference in their academics, their friendships, their social skills because of the anxiety symptoms that they're having. And so when I think of this, I think of five different things. That it's important when somebody's having anxiety that we don't try to rationalize, right? If I, my little is saying, the peas cannot possibly touch the potatoes. Okay, <laughs> all right, I got it. Peas cannot touch the potatoes. Because if we try to rationalize at the moment that somebody's having anxiety, it's really discounting the experience that they're having. Um, the second thing I think of is to validate their experience. I can totally get why the peas should not touch the potatoes. I validate that you feel that way. It doesn't even have to be your perspective. And I think people think that if I validate that I'm agreeing with them and I'm saying no, you're understanding them and you might have a different perspective and that's okay. Uh, the third thing is that you maintain your own cool. And so I always have four questions in a crisis that I kind of ask myself. And the first one is, what am I feeling now? Because if we're getting ramped up as we're providing care and support to somebody with anxiety, we're not doing them any good at all. Um, and so what am I feeling now is the first question I ask myself. The second is, what is this child feeling, needing, or wanting, knowing that be all behavior has meaning? And... We're, we need to get at the unmet needs, feelings, maybe even the trauma, um, wired response that the child is having right now. Uh, the third question I ask myself is, uh, how is the environment contributing? So if there's an audience, do I need to have the audience go? Do I need to isolate the conversation in some way so that it 
saves face for this this child and they can re-enter back into the routine better. And then the last question is how do I best respond? And a lot of times as adults we start at how do I best respond? And so if we can slow down that process a little by asking those questions, what am I feeling now? What is this child feeling, needing, or wanting? How is the environment affecting? And then respond. It's just a, a, a better practice, I think, and you'll have better outcomes. Um, another thing to consider is just leading with unconditional love, compassion, empathy. I know Brene Brown has a great um, video that you can watch around empathy and what empathy is and what it isn't. And I just really encourage you to Google that and watch that. It's a great way of approaching anybody that's having a mental health crisis or just an emotional crisis. Um, and then the other big emphasis is don't pretend that it never happened. When a child is in an anxious place, right, when they come down, I think that we can do one of three things at that point. We can ignore it and pretend that it never happened and then there's no new valuable coping skills for that child, right? They don't know how that, that same incident will happen again and again and again and that will be their response. Or we can even do more damage where we can um, debrief with that child and, and place the blame on the child and do damage. But there's this whole other place that we can go after an anxiety, they're coming back down to baseline, which is talking it through and talking about what could happen next time differently. What support do you need from me? What were you feeling at that time? What was maybe happening through your head, depending on their age and whether they're able to put thoughts to how they were feeling? And I think that's a really powerful um, place to be is after a crisis, there can be really rich opportunities for growth for some of the students that we work with. <coughs> so what do these you know, youth look like? Uh, same as what I talked about at tier one, just maybe with a little more intensity, right? And some of the strategies other than the ones that I just mentioned um, are the wellness plans again. I'm just going to keep putting that on every slide because I really believe in it. Uh, there's also screening tools and the caution with screening tools would be one, get the parents on board before you're going to screen. I, I really believe that parents need to know what they're being screened for. And two, do you have the capacity, the people in place, the workforce in place to manage what the outcome of the screening is? Because if we're just going to screen kids and then we don't have a place to refer them to, that's the difficulty. So what relationships have we developed with people that can support if somebody comes out, uh, out high on the anxiety scales? And then the progress measure piece for me is once interventions have been put in place, are we going back and looking at them and making sure that that's working? And if we're not doing that, um, you know, we're not giving the, the child or the family the feedback loop that you really deserve because a lot of times um, when you're in the anxiety piece in life, you don't even realize that you're making improvements. And so the antidote oftentimes to anxiety is knowledge and knowing the improvements that you're making can be really, really powerful. And also if you're not making improvements, knowing that something needs to be tweaked, that it's not something that you're wrong in some way, but that something can be tweaked and we can redo our plans with how we manage anxiety. A little bit about Youth Mental Health First Aid. Uh, it is an eight hour training. We have a grant through Project AWARE right now that we can provide some free trainings throughout the state. I know Elmbrook is on and I know we've provided a couple through the grant for Elmbrook um, and other places uh, throughout the state, especially I think in like the Green Bay area, we really had a lot of saturated trainings there. And it ba basically is giving you some mental health literacy so that you kind of understand the language around mental health issues. Um, but it's also giving you some anti-stigma messages that I think are really important. Um, and it gives you a five-step approach to listening and being able to support somebody having emotional crises, including anxiety crises. Um, the other thing is managing the acute systems, uh, uh, symptoms. And so a lot of people will have um, a transient anxiety experience after a situation or an experience. In our town and community that I um, was working in in central Wisconsin area, we had a huge hailstorm, uh, like huge, 
ginormous hailstorm. And a lot of kids after that hailstorm, because it was right at the end of the school day, and a lot of them were kind of caught in parking lots and different things and watching things get smashed. Um, when we manage acute issues that happen, and we kind of triage those issues and we have conversations around them, um, it's so important uh, to bring the anxiety back down so that that trauma loop is not you know, re-intensify for people. So how we manage the acute sy symptoms of anxiety is important. I talk about a little bit adaptations, accommodations, modifications. Now this is language that I know our other side of DPI works on in the compliance special ed department. I'm not talking about it in that way because a lot of kids with mental health challenges don't necessarily need IEP or special education services, but they still need adaptations, accommodations, and modifications. We need to be aware uh, for my stepson, you know, the, the algebra class, yes, that was the place he should be in, but he could not be in. So to keep pushing him to be in that algebra class, it was only going to make him more and more behaviorally um, challenging. And so listening to what the youth is saying about what they need is really important. Accommodations used with caution, though. Sometimes accommodations without exposure therapy um, will actually perpetuate the feeling of I'm not ever going to get good at that, right? As a technical term, going to get good at that. Um, so an example would be my stepdaughter, I didn't think she was ever going to drive a car, yet she needed to drive a car. We wanted her to get a job and to be able to drive to the job and not have to follow her on to college and drive her to where she needed to go. And so that was a huge life skill that she needed. And so exposure therapy was, let's just do the parking lot for a week and really navigate how the car feels. Let's do the one mile loop around the block. You only have to make right turns. We're not even gonna try left turns. Then the next week, let's add on one left turn. Let's add on a block. And so it's exposing to brief and successful interventions and ways that they can build upon their skills, if that makes sense. Um, so yes, it's accommodating, but it's also providing, here's where we wanna get to in the end. Our current com accommodations will help you now, but here's our goal. How can we work to get there? And then again, just capturing the youth voice in planning. Uh, let's see. Um, I just share this as an example of some of the screening tools I mentioned in the previous. There's many that are out there and, and a lot of them don't have any proprietary um, to them. And so then when we look at anxiety in the tier three, those are those really intense anxiety kids. So a couple stories I can share is um, working with a youth that uh, literally had to be wheeled out of the ACT testing, had literally frozen during an ACT testing and had to be put in a wheelchair and taken out. Or another kiddo I worked with that had a severe trauma experience witnessed a person in his life die by a car accident. And then what did we, what, what did we need to do to come together and collaborate to help support his ability to still work at his academics yet really let his brain heal from the extreme trauma that he had experienced. So those are just two like extreme examples and then I also think about um, anxiety on a continuum of sometimes in your life your anxiety will increase to a point where it becomes debilitating but it doesn't mean that's always going to be there and it will de decrease. So for example a woman that I was working with was going through a divorce and under extreme stress, she was getting up multiple times a night and checking all the doors and gas, gas being off and all that stuff. Very temporary experience to stress. She, it was debilitating because she wasn't getting enough sleep. And so we know that sleep restores us and that was actually exacerbating her anxiety. And so there's gonna be times where some people are in that tier three place, right? but it doesn't mean that they're gonna stay there if we give them the right um, supports. So here are some of the resources and strategies that I've identified for school-age youth. Um, 
The emotional regulation plans, we do have those available at DPI. I'm not sure, I'd have to give Tim the link where they are located, but those are really um, very specific plans that help youth identify how does my body feel when this is happening and when my body is feeling this way, what are some of the supports and interventions that I can use and that I need. There are also crises, crises and safety planning, and a lot of times, um, let's say when a youth is discharged from a hospitalization stay, you know, we want to make sure that they have crises and safety planning um, in place, but also to prevent any hospitalization stays, we can do crises and safety planning. Who, do I, who can I go to? Who do I need to talk to? Anxiety is um, linked to suicidality because it's so debilitating for a person um, to just feel like I will never think, feel, get better. And then post-crisis debriefing, we talked about that a little, but it's just really important that after crises happens, we provide new opportunities for kids to um, have a plan in place that's going to work for them. I don't know how, I, how many teams I've been on where I, I sat with the team and I've developed like the best plan ever and the kid just doesn't cooperate when they come back. The problem became is I never asked the kid what would work for you, would that work for you to be able to um, go down to the office and talk to somebody or would that not? Um, and so making sure that our post crises debriefing encourages that. With reentry planning, those are times where I want you to imagine that you've had like your worst meltdown day. I mean, maybe even you threw things or like spouted something out to somebody that you loved and, and, and really hurt their feelings. And I want you to imagine that you have that day in school. And maybe next hour you have to go back to class in front of your peers. And we know peers are so kind about those meltdowns, right? They're just very understanding, usually. Um, or you have to go back the next week after a major meltdown. And so um, oftentimes as adults, we know that we can have our meltdowns at home in private. But with kids, you, prefrontal cortex is not fully developed. There's no judgment of where it's appropriate to have a meltdown or not, right? Um, and so when we have re-entry, what are we doing to plan and to make sure that the class knows what's happening. Talking to the class and debriefing with the class. Here's what happened and here's the supports that um, she's saying she needs as she comes back today. And um, in a, some of our schools we do restorative practice where we circle up and we talk in circles about um, what just happened and how we can best support one another through that. With the CST, the Coordinated Services Teams and the Comprehensive Community Service, not all um, kids are going to qualify for the CCS programs, um, but most kids could get involved with coordinated service team where we do wraparound models and everybody kind of comes together with those um, kiddos to support them. After listening to Hugh, I'm also going to put up here parent peer specialists in the future. That will be on my new slide because we are seeing really um, profound empowerment of parents which a profoundly empowered parent can help their child better. And so the parent peer specialist is not for the anxious youth, but the parent peer specialist is for the parent of an anxious youth. And I think that would be a really important connection um, for people to make. A lot of times I hear, how do we motivate schools to come together around this topic? I think clearly defining what the role is for them, what the time is, the time commitment on some of these teams is really important. Making sure we do the perspective shift of youth would do well if they can. I also want to say parents would do well if they can. And then if we can even take it one step further, teachers would do well if they can. Our teachers are vastly under supported with mental health knowledge. It's part of why where Youth Mental Health First Aid comes in, it gives them a lot of literacy around mental health. I'll stand in a room of over 100 educators and ask them to raise their hand if they've received any education around mental health in their undergrad or graduate work. I get very few hands up. Yet one in five of their students in front of them are coming in with significant mental health needs. And so that's you know a perspective shift I really encourage people to have too. That we all are just working together. We need to put our fingers away and just kind of get to the table and work together. 
Um, balancing the needs of the individual student in the learning environment, if we can lead with that discussion, that's really helpful. And a, a teacher's main and administrator is administrator's main objective is to really maximize the classroom learning time. Um, but if we don't have the tools to manage the issues, they're they're not um, really in a learning brain mode, right? There's, this is not exhaustive. I mean, there's lots of stuff out there. Mindfulness, brain breaks, all those things that really support youth in school in general. Um, social emotional learning competencies I know we're working on as a team. And if we can, you know, support all those things, that would be helpful too. I recently have run across, and I didn't have a chance to put it on here, um, a thing called The Mighty, which is a free subscription you can get. It has amazing YouTube um, videos on there of kids telling here's what's going on in my head when I'm feeling anxious and so if you want to you know incorporate that in a professional development with your, your staff those videos can kind of lead into some deeper discussions around what kind of supports so as I'm ending and Tim wanted me to come up with questions right yes. you may have some but I also have a few um, in the work that you've been doing with youth, how might you now reframe a youth's behavior where before it might have been manipulative or resistant? What shift have you made in that thought? And then with that shift, what might shift in your discipline practices, interventions, and treatment of that youth? So as you move through your group discussions, those are two things that kind of came to my head. What else did you think about? Um, I thought about the ones that you sent me beforehand. <coughs> <laughs> yep, what were those? So I wrote them down. They were great. I loved them. Um, they were, what supports or services do you see in your schools right now? What needs to be in that plan um, in those places? So that whole discussion about what supports and services are there, what supports and services could be helpful. In what ways are your communities coming together around mental health issues um, and, and, and connecting that way? is I know that we have some sites that have multiple players from different parts, different agencies, different organizations. What is being done to sort of coordinate and, and bring that work together? Um, what connections can you make today? And then what challenges are parents or families um, needing supports around? Um, where, where are they struggling in the area of anxiety? Um, and in this case, anxiety and autism. Mm -hmm. So I think that whole discussion about, you know, and. And even, you know, one of the things that I really like about that framework is I was sitting back thinking, you know, these aren't just things to do at school. No. <laughs> these are things I can do with my family. Yeah. You know, I can do those check-ins. I can make sure that I'm not, like, throwing these surprises on my anxious child. Um, that whole story of accommodations, very similar to how we taught our son um, mm -hmm. to drive as well. Um, and so we taught him drive. He finally got his license. Um, and then he didn't want to drive, you know, once he had his license, he's like, great, I'm done. Thanks very yeah. much. We're like, no, 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 that's not the point. This is not a checkbox. Yes, this is a no, you need to continue to drive. And so, you know, we let him do these little trips. And then he finally found something that he really wanted to go to. Um, happened to be an adult, um, a, a game night with the Autism Society of South Central Wisconsin, um, a board free game night. Yeah. And I'm like, Hunter, I'm at work. Your mom has danced. You're sorry it's in it's in madison well I, I i think i could do it great so he put on the gps and he got himself to madison college and he got home and he loved it it was great and it was you know again empowering but he didn't just do that right after he got his license i mean this is two and a half years later of driving around stoughton yeah. that he was finally able to drive to madison so it's those little steps but it's those accommodations the small successes mm -hmm. of helping that child with anxiety that they can build on um, so I really thought that, you know, everything that you're saying was very applicable, you know, outside of the school framework. This is yeah. good stuff for life. Mm -hmm. um, so I really appreciate it. So one of the discussions you might have is how can we work these frameworks into where we're working? How can we work these frameworks into our connections um, in our community? How can we, we embed them in what we do? So a lot of stuff that you could talk about. Um, fantastic. So um, please um, join me in thanking Christy. Um, and so we are going to uh, break off of the feed for the site discussions. Um, I do, I know some people are just joining for parts of the day and where they can. 
um, I just want to let you know that if you have registered either beforehand or registered day of at your site um, with your email, you will get a feedback form. We do want to figure out what else can we do in this method. Does this method work? Um, all those good questions that we'll ask. If you are joining by your personal computer, if you registered online as saying, I'm going to join by my personal computer, you will get that follow-up email. Matter of fact, if you registered that you were joining at your personal computer and you really didn't sign up and you're not really listening right now, you're getting the email too because I have no way to tell whether you're there or not. But if you signed on your personal computer and you never registered, please send me an email at tmarkle, M-A-R-K-L-E, at wisc, W-I-S-C, dot edu. Number one, I need, to, I need to figure out how many people we're reaching, how is this working. Um, but more importantly, I want you to be able to get, give us feedback as well. So if I don't know you're listening, I can't give you that opportunity. So please let me know so that I can get you that opportunity. So um, let us go ahead and spend about 15, 20 minutes um, in discussion. I think there's a lot to talk about. Um, and then take another short break. I know some people will be coming and going.